Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue looking at amplifier classes by looking at the RF version of the Class D amplifier. In a similar fashion to the Audio Class D amplifier, the RF version is still using the transistors as switches to improve on efficiency and it still uses filters to extract the useful signal, but that's about it with the common bits. The rest of the operating principles are a bit different. However, since it's a switching amplifier, it's a high efficiency amplifier, so getting above 80% in the real world is not that difficult, so in certain cases, it's a good topology for your RF needs. So if you're curious about how it works and what are the various implementations, then keep watching. So first off, how does it work? What is the general operating principle behind the RF Class D amplifier? Well, in a nutshell, it's built with either two or four switching transistors conducting in opposition with the goal of creating a square wave, either a voltage square wave or a current square wave. And then you need a filter to extract usually the fundamental switching frequency from this square wave. So to leave just a single frequency sine wave on the output. Now, doesn't sound that complicated now, does it? To better understand the concepts, I've prepared a set of simulations in LTSpice so we can observe the various behaviors and operating principles. So let's start with the basic voltage switching class D amplifier. First thing, we need to create a voltage square wave. This can be achieved by using two switches that are driven in opposition. The exact driving method and switch components can vary, of course. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I will stick to ideal switch components and some logic circuits. So I'm driving these switches in opposition using an inverting gate. Now, the signal source that we will be working with is a 5 MHz 50% duty cycle square wave, and this is what will get amplified by our switch. So if we run the circuit, look at the output, we see our very nice square wave, where the frequency is equal to that of the input signal, so this blue signal is the input signal, both signals are the same. And even though this is a nice square wave in the time domain, if we look at it in the frequency domain, so using an FFT analysis, we can very clearly see our fundamental frequency, so at 5 MHz, and then various upper harmonics. So to be able to output a sine wave using this type of amplifier, we will need to isolate this fundamental frequency and filter out everything else. So the next element that we need to add into our amplifier is a filter. Therefore, the next element that we need is a resonance circuit. And for the voltage switching amplifier, it's a series resonance circuit, so a series RLC circuit, where the R part is the output load. So I calculated the set of values for these components that have a Q factor of 3.16, and if we look at the output, we can see a very nice sine wave appearing on the load. So by filtering our square wave, we obtain a sine wave, and this is the output of our voltage switching class D amplifier. Next, let's look at the basic current switching class D amplifier. Similar to the voltage switching one first task is to create a current square wave. And there are two main implementations for this. First off, you have the two switch version, and here again the switches need to be driven in opposition, so again I'm using this inverting logic gate, and to ensure that our current gets actually limited, we also need these series radio frequency chokes. So this way when either of the switches are activated, you don't just short circuit the supply to ground. So if we run this simulation, and we look at the current running through our load, we can see a very nice current square wave this time, so the current is going between two extremes, and this is perfectly synchronized with our input voltage signal. Now, there is also a four switch version of the circuit, so you can use a full bridge using four switches, and you only need a single inductor to limit the current this time. So here again, the switches need to be driven in opposition, so there's always two switches active on the diagonal. And if we look at the behavior of this circuit, again, we see our very nice current square wave. Now, as before, we do have a square wave, but we're not interested in the full spectral content of this wave, we're only interested in the fundamental switching frequency. So to extract it, we again need a filter. 
And this time, the resonance circuit needs to be of parallel type. So for the current switching amplifier, we need a parallel RLC circuit. So again, I have the same 10 ohm load as before, and I calculated the capacitor and inductor to have the same Q factor of 3.16 as we had in the previous schematic. So if we look at how these circuits work, so we can look at the voltage appearing on our load, so we have a nice sine wave, and we can also see that the current running through the load is also a sine wave. So these are for the two switch circuit, and we get the same thing, so of different values of course, but the same waveforms for the four switch implementation. So either with a voltage switching circuit or with a current switching circuit, you can generate these sine waves into your load. Now, there are a few variations on the basic circuits that try to fix some of the drawbacks. First problem is the output load. So the power that is delivered by the amplifier is determined by the supply voltage and the load resistance. But if your final load is a different value, well, you need some sort of conversion circuit, an impedance matching circuit. Second thing to mention is the output reference. Do you want a single-ended output or a differential one? With the voltage switching circuit, the output was of single-ended type. It had to be referenced to ground. For the current switching circuit, it was of differential type. Both output lines ended up swinging around a fixed value point. But what if you want things the other way around? Well, to fix both issues, both the output impedance and the output reference problem, the first thing to try is using a transformer. This brings us to the transformer coupled voltage switching class D amplifier. So for this circuit, we still are using two switches driven in opposition. So again, using this inverting gate, we still have our series RLC circuit to filter out the upper harmonics, but the interconnection between the two bits of the circuit is done using a transformer. So this transformer has a primary winding with a center tap through which the circuit is supplied, and then the secondary winding is driving the output. So with this one-to-one -one configuration, if we run the circuit, we can see that we are getting a plus minus 10 volt output, where this 10 volt is the value of the supply voltage. But of course, you can generate any value you want based on the ratio of the turns in the transformer. So if we want to drive a different load value with the same amount of power, we can simply change the output voltage. So I prepared the second circuit where the load is 20 ohms and the secondary side of the transformer has a larger inductance value, so more turns. And to keep the two circuits comparable, I have recalculated the LC components to keep the same Q factor. So now we can compare the circuits by looking at the output power and we can observe that both of them have the exact same output power delivery. So by changing the output voltage, we can change the output load and keep the same output power. Now, the secondary circuitry can be left reference to ground as I left it here, so to have a single-ended output, or you can leave it floating to have a differential output. So it all depends on your exact application. In a similar fashion, we can use a transformer on our current switching amplifier. So first off, looking at the two switch version of the circuit, we have the same type of transformers, so it's center tapped transformer on the primary, and then a single winding on the secondary. Now, when using this type of circuit, it's important to remember that we still need our current limiting series inductor in the supply, so we will still need this component. So if we check out the circuit, we can see our clear square wave coming out of the transformer. So this is the current square wave that is driving our output load. And of course, we can use a transformer on the four switch implementation. So here we just need a simple two winding transformer, no more center tap required. And with this again, we are getting our square wave output. And this time, based on the turns ratio, we can change the current amplitude. Now, in all of these cases, the secondary can again be left grounded to have a single ended output, or it can be left floating to have a differential output. It all depends on your exact design needs. So by taking this transformer approach, we can fix the impedance mismatch problem, but are still left with an issue, signal purity. So the only reason why the output is a sine wave is because of the resonant RLC circuit 
that we design. The only thing we can do with it to improve the response is adjust the Q factor. Common values start at about 3. But increasing Q factor will be however limited. What do you do if you need an even better attenuation of higher frequency harmonics? Well, this is where multi-stage lossless impedance matching networks come into play. This will fix not just the filtration issue, but will also help with the impedance matching. So if we need to change the output load, we can also use matching circuit built with inductors and capacitors. And the first thing to consider is the frequency passing effect. So our input signal has upper harmonics. So we're interested in the fundamental and we want to filter out all of these upper frequency spikes. So we need a low pass type of filter, which means we will have series inductors and parallel capacitors. So we can go for a single LC matching circuit. So I prepared here a circuit that matches the 10 ohms output of the initial amplifier to a 20 ohm load. So if we run the two circuits, we can check the output power and we can see that we roughly have the same amount of power being delivered in both our circuits. We can of course go one step further, improve our matching network and go for either a Pi or a T type matching network. So this is a higher order filter which should have an even better filtration effect. Again if we look at the output power, in all of the cases we roughly have the same amount of power getting delivered to the load. So all four of these circuits are delivering the same amount of power. What is different though is the noise that they are delivering. So if we strictly focus on the voltage waveforms that are reaching the load and analyze them in an FFT analysis, we can see that with our base RLC circuit, so without any sort of matching network, the amplitude difference between our fundamental and the highest harmonic is about 20-30 decibels. If we go for the single stage LC matching network, this increases to about 38 to 40 decibels, so a 10 decibel increase. And finally, if we go to our more complex matching network, so either the Pi or T matching circuits, they both have roughly the same response. Here the difference between the fundamental and the first peak is about 50 something decibels. So higher order matching circuits will improve the filtration effect. So less and less noise will end up on the output. Now the last thing to mention is that although the same principles apply for the current switching versions, you will commonly see T-type matching networks in voltage switching circuits and Pi-type matching networks in current switching circuits. The reason behind this being the final number of components needed in the matching network. So in the T-matching network used on the voltage switching circuit, the series inductor from the matching network and the series inductor from the initial RLC circuit can be combined into a single component. So you don't need 5 components, you only need 4 components. In a similar fashion, using a Pi network on a current switching circuit, you can combine the first element with one of the elements from the original RLC circuit. So this is one reason why you wouldn't normally use a Pi network on a voltage switching circuit, or a T network on a current switching one. Now we talked a lot about current switching and voltage switching circuits, but what is really the difference? I mean, what should you be looking at when choosing between the two types? Well, this has to do with efficiency and parasitics. So until this point when analyzing the two types of circuits, the voltage and the current switching one, we considered our switches to be ideal. So sure they had a small on resistance, but other than that they were behaving like ideal switches. However, in the real world, the switches and the interconnecting circuitry has a few problems and non-ideal behaviors. And these will impact the two types of circuit in different ways. So first off, any switch transistor has some output parallel capacitance. And this can be modeled with capacitors in parallel with the switch. So I just used some 100 picofarad capacitors on both of our circuits. Now if we check the behavior of these circuits, so first let's look at the current consumed by the ideal voltage switching circuit. So we have peaks of, I don't know, 600 milliamps. If we look at the same thing with the added capacitors, we can see some huge spikes appearing. So by adding these capacitors, current consumption greatly increases for the voltage mode circuit. If we look at our current mode circuit, so let's just check the input current 
on the first circuit. Well, it's the same as on the second circuit. And if we check the power delivered to the load, it's the same in both circuits. So with the current mode implementations, adding these capacitors doesn't matter, but it has a great impact on the voltage switching circuit. And the reason for this being that with the voltage switching circuit, since we're switching between zero and supply voltage, we're constantly charging and discharging these capacitors, which creates a lot of loss. So all the energy that gets charged into these capacitors gets discharged over the switch, which is then dissipated as heat. With the current mode implementation, if we look at the voltage on the switch and the moment when the switches are actually switching, we are still getting some current spikes, but the interesting behavior that appears is that the switches are transitioning when the voltage goes through zero. So basically, we're not really discharging the capacitors because the voltage on them is already at zero when the switch is transitioning. This way the capacitors do charge and discharge, but in a perfectly reactive way where they don't influence the overall efficiency of the circuit. Now, the other important parasitic element that can appear is series inductance. So inductance in series with the switches. This can be caused by trace lengths or other built-in elements from the circuit construction and layout. So we can implement these as inductors in series with the switches, so on the left side with the voltage switching circuit, and on the right side with the current switching circuit. So other than these inductors with the current switching circuit, I also added this resistor because LT Spice was giving some errors since it was seeing this node as floating. So this resistor is not really affecting the performance, it's just there for simulation stability. So if we look at these simulations, so first off the voltage mode circuit, we can look at the current consumed with our original circuit and the one with series inductors, same current gets consumed. And if we look at the power delivered, the exact same power gets to the load. So adding these series inductors is not a problem. They do not affect efficiency. And this can be clearly observed because these series inductors become part of the final RLC circuit. So right now the inductor in the circuit is not one microhenry as before, it's only half a microhenry because the other half is in the switch. Now if we look at the current switching circuit, look at the output power, and compare this to the initial ideal circuit, we can see that far more power gets delivered by the ideal circuit than by the circuit that has these series inductances. So having these series inductors greatly limits the amount of voltage that can reach the final load and therefore the final power that can reach the load. Now in real life you will have both these issues, you will have series inductors and you will have parallel capacitors, but depending on which is more significant, you can choose the appropriate switching method. So if the capacitors are the predominant problem then you should go for current switching circuitry, if series inductance is the predominant problem, you should go for voltage switching circuitry. So there are a lot of ways in which the class D amplifier can be implemented based on your exact needs. Some are more simple and some are more complex. Now to better understand these principles, it's best to also try to apply them. So next time I will start designing such an amplifier and afterwards build and test it. But until then, Hope you got some useful information after this, leave it out in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be updated on my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.